today. Um, always appreciate anybody who takes the time out to, you know, um, think a little bit about EMC and think a little bit about how it can apply to, you know, the, the work that you're doing day to day. Um, I wanted to introduce myself as both a principal scientist for EMA, uh, electromagnetic applications here in Denver, um, but I'm also transitioning to um, my own company. So my own company is EMC United. Um, it's we're in that transition period where I'm I'm still supporting both. Uh, for instance, I've got a website www.emcunited.com, but not a LinkedIn page yet. So uh, if anybody wants to reach out for you know for either company, just let me know. So speaking today of unintentional antennas, one of the things that I wanted to do when I first put together this talk is I knew that my audience would be very broad and there would be people who were just starting out who you know, are encountering these topics for the very first time. And for folks like that, I wanna make sure that you get some fundamentals, some basics on how this weird world of electromagnetics can manifest itself in ways that you know that are a little bit counterintuitive and some of the common pitfalls that you should watch out for. Um, but for folks in the audience who you know have decades of experience or you know very deep depth of experience in these topics, I also hope that you'll get something out of this as well. And in particular, some examples and some analogies and some language that will help you communicate some of these very strange uh, topics to non-specialists. So that might be you know, management, it might be customers, but it might also be, you know, other engineers who just have not had the same exposure to electromagnetic compatibility. So with that, um, I always like to start out, you know, what is EMC? So EMC, electromagnetic compatibility. Um, and my elevator pitch for EMC, when people are like, what do you do? Is, you know, when you have to put, pack a lot of electronics into a platform, and that can be a phone, it can be a satellite, it can be an aircraft, a car. Uh, you need to make sure that they all play nice together. Um, there's some synonyms, so related acronyms are EMI, so for ele electromagnetic interference, uh, EME, E cubed. Uh, a new one is EMR, so that's electromagnetic resilience, and this is a topic of, of active research, particularly in Europe. Um, where the idea is that because we can't test for everything, we need to design for resilience. So if you ever get a chance to look up some of that research, I highly recommend it. But, you know, most people encounter EMC in terms of, oh dear, I've got an EMC problem. Now to have an EMC problem, you need three things. And I kind of refer to this as the fire triangle of EMC. So the way a lot of us learned that to have a fire, you know, we probably learned this in elementary school or such, um, to have a fire, you need to have a heat source, fuel, and oxygen. And if you take away one of those things, then you've put out the fire. Um, for EMC, you need three things. You need a noisy source, a sensitive victim, and a coupling path between them. And that coupling path could be through, you know, if you've got multiple things plugged into the same power bus, um, then you get conducted uh, interference. But then if you, you know, if that's not the case, um, what we're often dealing with is radiated emissions that are interfering, coming from a noisy source and interfering with a sensitive victim. A real world example of this, and, you know, it might seem a little trivial, but uh, it's, it's such a great illustration. So a colleague of mine uh, posted on LinkedIn, that they'd bought a new refrigerator. So this is back in 2021. Uh, they'd had a refrigerator in their kitchen for years. Uh, they'd always had an FM radio right next to it so that, you know, as they were cooking dinner or what have you, they could, you know, listen to the news or listen to music. Um, but then finally that refrigerator got to the end of its lifespan and they bought a new one. So they left the, you know, FM radio in the same place, not thinking anything of it. But as soon as they would open the new fridge door, the FM radio would fritz out. And that's just a classic radiated emissions problem. Um, and one of the interesting things is that, you know, the refrigerator as a whole was almost certainly tested to FCC uh, compliance limits. And those limits are set at, you know, either three meters or 10 meters. So what we call the, the far field. Um, I imagine that when the door opened, it was much closer. It was probably, you know, a meter or less uh, next to that FM radio. So, you know, this is probably a compliant uh, you know, a compliant 
how do you say, refrigerator. Um, it's just a matter of it wasn't tested or designed for that kind of compatibility. And so it's really that radiated path that is going to be the focus of this entire talk. And basically what it comes down to now, it, it used to be that I could just say who would put an antenna in a refrigerator, but now we have smart refrigerators, you know, that can probably communicate on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So now I have to say who would put a non Wi-Fi or non Bluetooth antenna in refrigerator and specifically the kind of antenna that could affect an FM radio, which of course is, is you know, uh, hanging out between 88 and 188, sorry, 108 megahertz. So how the, one of the issues is that we tend to all think we know what antennas look like, right? So you've got the really big antennas that can talk to space, like the Goldstone antenna here from NASA. Um, you've got the old rabbit ears that, you know, you used to have to mess with like long, long ago, you'd have to mess with, with these kind to get your good TV reception over the air. And of course now, you know, probably the vast majority of people in this audience are wearing an antenna of some kind on their person right now. Right. So, you know, in your phone, in your smartwatch, um, you know, there's no end of, of internet of things where, you know, you've got antennas integrated into a device. The problem is that this, this right here, this power brick, uh, this is also an antenna. And how do we know that this is also an antenna? Because of that thing. So that is a uh, common mode choke or a ferrite. Uh, the only reason it would be there is if this particular device uh, went in for FCC or some other regulatory testing, failed radiated uh, or conducted emissions, limits and then had to add this to suppress the noise uh, that's coming out of it. Um, and the consequence of this, I mean, it, it might seem pretty easy to fix, right? Um, you, you know, you have a noise problem, you add this ferrite and now, now you don't have a noise problem anymore. The problem is that you've now added cost, you know, however many cents every ferrite is going to cost on every power supply uh, that this manufacturer is making. And you've also shortened the lifespan of the unit because having that mass there, because you know that that um, that ferrite is made of iron or some other ferrous metal. So it's it's pretty heavy. It's putting extra wear and tear on that connector. And so it's going to shorten the lifespan of the entire device. So you know there, there are real downsides to um, to finding these problems so late that uh, ferrite is your only option. And so one of the things that we're really going to talk about in, in this particular presentation is, you know, how do things like this happen? Uh, where can you spot them? And how can you try and uh, fix these problems in the design phase so that you don't end up adding cost and schedule and weight and redesigns at the very end of your product life cycle? So when I first, uh, when I started teaching this topic, um, I started, you know, started to explain antennas. And then I realized that there was a fundamental level where I did not understand how antennas worked. Um, and, you know, it, it really kind of goes against intuition, right? Because we've always learned that no current flows in an open circuit, right? So when the switch is off, uh, there, you know, there's a break in the circuit, there's no current flowing, and then you close the switch, you create the conducted path, and you have power floating to your, you know, light bulb or what have you. So how does current flow in a system like this? This is a, you know, a classic center fed dipole. There's no conductive path between the two arms of the dipole. There's a voltage source between them, but there isn't a conducted path uh, between them. It, it really looks like an open circuit. So after I spent a lot of time 